the next major character of the book is coming on the stage, which is Saul. There's Samuel, then there's Saul, and then there's David, the three main characters of this particular book. And uh, we saw uh, a couple chapters ago how um, Saul met Samuel. And then we saw in the last chapter how uh, Samuel anointed Saul and uh, pretty much wrote it in a book that there would be a kingdom and this is how the kingdom would go forth. And now in the 11th chapter, we see a curious chapter. <laughs> uh, we'll title it at the end. We'll try and come up with a title at the end because so many themes are running through here. I, I struggled greatly to find a single theme. There are many pieces of fabric woven together here. And uh, so what we see is it opens up in the first few verses with uh, Samuel has anointed Saul. Saul is headed back to his home. And then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh uh, said unto Nahash, make, it a, make a covenant with us and, and we will serve thee. And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, on this occasion will I make a covenant with you that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. And the elders of Jabesh said unto him, well, we'll give us seven days respite that we may send messengers unto all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, uh, we will come out to thee. Okay, so here's the issue. We have been rolling from the time of the judges to the time of establishing a kingdom and having a king. And at this particular time, um, men were doing that which is right in their own eyes, and they were kind of becoming, if you will, little individual uh, city-states, kind of like Greece was a long time ago. Greece was like these little individual met metropolises, city-states. They never quite organized well. And the Lord is now trying to organize them into a kingdom. I don't think Nahash is aware of this at the time. He's not even aware of the fact that they had anointed a king or any such a thing. And so he's just figuring, I'll take this uh, a city of uh, Jabesh Gilead. On a map here, I'll show you where it is. If you remember correctly, um, you've got the Jordan River here and the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And over in the westward area is Israel proper. Judah has from this boundary line down to about here, and the Amalekites are south of there. The Philistines are encamped in against the river, uh, the Mediterranean Sea there. And then above Judah is the region of oh, Benjamin and Ephraim and Manasseh, and then other tribes have up in the north region here. When they were settling the land way back in the book of Joshua, three of the tribes determined not to come in across the Jordan River and live in the safe region. They had thought this would be a nice region to live in. This is Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And they were living out here just a little bit east of the Jordan River. It's a picture, as we talked about a long time ago. We look, we look for portraits. Um, the Lord determination for the people he redeemed out of Egypt was to live in the promised land. The promised land for us would be a portrait of somebody God has redeemed. One of the great promises he has for you is, uh, Jesus said one day, he says, no man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel or under a bed. He says he lights a candle and puts it on a candlestick. Okay, And then he said in the book of Revelation, the candlestick is the church. And the promised land for a Christian is being well settled in a good local church. And in that local church, of course, there are battles and there are problems just like these people had, but it's much safer inside the boundaries God has set. These three tribes represent someone that didn't particularly want to get into God's will. They still wanted the blessings of God a little bit, but they didn't want to labor for God. They stood outside the promised land, be a picture of, let's say, a Christian who doesn't want to go to church, wants to live his own way. And this region of Jabesh Gilead is out here. It's a city out here uh, kind of on its own. You can see a lot of problems here. You've got Edomites, you've got Moabites, you've got Ammonites. Up above here, you're going to have people from the region of Jordan and Lebanon and Syria and a lot of problems. It's a lot of problems there. This is much safer inside the geographic boundaries God has with the rivers and the sea. And so this is the region here. The Ammonites have determined to come up and uh, Nahash, the king of Ammon, 
has encamped against this is a good city inside there. Uh, they always like cities. Uh, rulers like cities because cities are well established. There's a little more commerce going on there. There's a little more wealth uh, there. It's more concentrated. There are more people to take as servants and hostages in a city than they're out in a spread out area. So he decides to come in against this region of Jabesh Gilead. Um, the, it's curious. Gilead, this area here, this is called the land of Gilead over here. You hear about the land of Gilead. This is a region that means a rocky. It's because it's kind of mountainous in there, but it's a rocky place to live, if you will. Um, the, the names tell us a portrait. Jabesh, the name Jabesh means a dry place. And so uh, territorially, this was a little bit more dry over here than this was the land of milk and honey where it drinks the rain of heaven. This is a rougher area to live. Uh, if you're a Christian who's determined, I don't particularly want to live the life God wants me to in a local church uh, serving and giving. In the local church, it's a two-way street. You know, I mean, you get served and you serve. And it's a little more work than just being a lone wolf Christian and living out here on your own. It's kind of a dry place out there. It's dry. It's much more moist inside the church where more of the water of the rain of the word is being poured on the people on a weekly basis. So they're out in this dry place and this guy Nahash decides to come after them. It's curious that, that Nahash, Nahash is, means serpent. It's almost, uh, what's that term, onomatopoeia, you know, where it sounds like it, uh, it's got the hiss of the serpent. It's kind of like the serpent making an attack on these people here. If you're living out your own way, spiritually, the serpent wants to pick on you. Uh, the, the enemy is also likened to a lion, as a roaring lion. You ever watch on those nature films, they like to find the weak, they like to find the sickly, they like to find the stray, they like to find the one that's out there on their own rather than getting one that's in the middle of the pack. And this is what's happening here, of course, historically, is just a, a king coming up and attacking a particular region. But uh, we see the spiritual portrait as to what's going on here. What, what, what's the offer he makes with these people? Well, he encamps against them for a while, and they finally say in uh, the first verse, they say to Nahash, well, make a covenant with us and we'll serve thee. In other words, it's rough out here, but I don't particularly want to get in the promised land and have to serve and do what God wants me to do. So let's, let's you and I, Mr. Serpent, Mr. World, let's make a covenant, you and I. Let me compromise my lifestyle with you, and I'll serve you all right. I mean, you'd be fair to me, and, and you know, we can work this thing out here. It's reasonable. Now, how does the serpent feel about that? So I'll make a covenant with you, verse 2. Here's how I'll make a covenant with you. I'm going to thrust out your right eye as a reproach on Israel. Now, historically, this is the way it worked. Back then, these men had to fight for their land, and they used swords, and they used shields. And what they used to do, most of them were right-handed. mentioned a few times they're left-handed. Most of them were right-handed. And the way they would go into battle is they would hold their shield up, hide their face, and they would keep their right eye on this side of the shield so that they could see in the battle. So what the serpent is saying, well, let me take your right eye out. First thing I want to do is I want to disable you so you can never fight the fight again. I want you disabled. See, these are portraits of what the serpent wants to do to a Christian. He wants to disable you. He says, and also I want to do it another reason, for a reproach upon Israel. Okay, uh, Israel was known as the nation that had the Lord as their God. And and if we can beat you, this is a reproach against your nation. Of course, if the serpent wants to get a Christian out there and he wants to take his right eye out, in other words, I don't want you looking at that book anymore, if thine eye be single. You know, I don't want that, I don't want you studying that book anymore. I don't want you to get into the study of the Word of God. And if I take that out, I'm going to disable you because without that book, you can't stand for God. And not only that, you're going to be a reproach to all Christianity because people are going to walk by and go, Look at that Christian. Some Christian he is. You see the way he wants? He wants to disable and he wants to disgrace and dishonor. That's what Nahash wants to do. Disable, disgrace, and dishonor. He wanted to do it to them historically. He'd like it to do it to us spiritually. It's a portrait of the way he works. 
Well, historically, we see what happens when this offer is made to them. The elders of Israel say, well, give us seven days respite that we may send messengers to all the coasts of Israel. And then if there be no man to save us, we will come out to thee. Uh, I mean, give us an opportunity to, to uh, get a little help on our side. Do you, would you at least do that for us? Now, Naash is so confident that this nation is in such disarray because they've been going through the period of judges. They don't seem to be united. They don't seem to work together. There seems to be such disunity in the nation of Israel. What do I have to fear? Because if they're not united, they'll never be able to stand. Little does Nahash realize God has now provided a king for them. And God is going to let this king help organize into battle. But he's confident. You know, God's provided a king for us. And if we would come to our king and we would allow him to work with us, and we would get into the place where he wants us, and we would call our brethren together who would pray for us, we could win some battles. Anyway, so this is what's happening, though, historically back here. So, okay, now we've got to figure this thing out. How are we going to do it? So they send some messengers, verse 4. Then came the messengers to Gibeah of Saul. On the map here, you can see Saul lives down in this region here, Gibeah. He's a Benjamite. Benjamite is uh, nestled right up against the land of Judah. And so it's down in this area here. It's about, as the bird flies, it's about a 50-mile shot. If you want to do it and cross the Jordan River and work your way down, it add about another 10 miles. It's about a 60-mile journey. So the messengers have to make this journey, I don't know, 60 miles. I don't know if they came on foot, traveling at 4 miles an hour. What is that? 4 into 60, 15 hours if you go straight without stopping. But if you maybe a two-day journey. If they're coming on horseback, they can do it much quicker. And they come to Gibeah of Saul. And they told the tidings in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voices and wept. You know, it's curious about this Jabesh Gilead place. They had earned a reputation for themselves. Uh, a while back, if, if you were to go back to the book of Judges, chapter 21. In Judges 21, the thing about this uh, Jabesh Gilead people, before Samuel was Ruth and then before that is Judges, at the time where there was the big battle where those, uh, that one tribe had uh, practiced wickedness and wanted to practice sodomy, and they went after that Levite, and then they killed his concubine. And the men of Israel got together, and they said, we can't have this type of wickedness in our land. They called for all the tribes together, and in Judges 21, verse 8, they said, what uh, one is there of the tribes of Israel that came not to Mitzpah to the Lord? And behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh Gilead, to the assembly. For the people were numbered, and behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead. The, those folks were known as, uh, we stand alone, and when there's a real battle to be fought for the Lord, we're fearful, we're uninterested, maybe we got cowardice, I don't know what the issue is, but we want no part of the battles that the Lord is fighting. We just want to be like, look, you know, I'm born again, but I'm not a Bible thumper. I don't even mention the word that I'm born again. I don't even like to talk about it. I just want to go along to get along with everybody out here. That's kind of the nature of the type of folks that they were. But they were still gods. Isn't that interesting? They were still the lords. Despite how they were misbehaving, they were still the lords. And that's good. The Lord knoweth them that are his. But they have a reputation for being fearful cowardly and uninterested in the things the Lord's interested in. Well, now they're in trouble. And when they're in trouble, they go running to the Lord for help. And the message comes to Saul's city of Gibeah. And when the Gibeonites hear about it, they weep. And they're upset over this thing. They're concerned. You know, we're supposed to weep when our brothers are in trouble. And uh, I know the first thing I do is just point a finger at them. Hey, you deserve what you're getting, brother. <laughs> but, but, but they're upset that these men are in trouble here. Uh, verse 5, And behold, Saul came after the herd out of the field, which I find interesting, because Saul had been anointed king in the last chapter. And Saul himself, instead of settling the kingdom, it says he went right back home to Gibeah. And he went back to home to Gibeah and he went back to farming and doing his work and working for his dad. 
instead of taking his place as a king. He kind of went back to his old way and uh, doing what he used to do. But when he hears of this, he asks, What aileth the people that they weep? And then they told him the tidings of the men of Jabesh. And I don't see any response out of Saul. I don't see any response. But then I see the next verse. And the Spirit of, the, of God came upon Saul when he heard those tidings, and his anger was kindled greatly. On his own, it may not have kindled him, but now the Lord is going to step in because these are his people. And despite the unfaithfulness of God's people, God is always faithful. And the Lord moves in and his spirit moves upon Saul. And now Saul's anger is kindled. It maybe didn't bother Saul, but it angered the Lord. And he let Saul know what God, God let him know. This is what I think about this. And he dropped that angry spirit right on Saul. You say, God get angry? Absolutely, God gets angry. God gets angry not just with sin, and that does anger him, but he really gets angry when people want to bring reproach on his name and that which he has established. That really angers the Lord. He's magnified his name and he's magnified his word above his name and uh, it, it brings, angers him greatly. Go, the spirit of anger that fell on Saul, uh, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. I mean, Nahash, if you will, the serpent, is oppressing God's people. And talking about thrusting their eye out, the eye of faith that God gave them. Uh, Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 7. That's oppressing the people of God. Ecclesiastes 7, 7. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad. And Saul is feeling the anger of the Lord because the Lord has a lot of wisdom and he doesn't like the oppression of his people. And this anger comes upon him. You know, the Bible says you can be angry and sin not. And, and Saul now having the anger of the Lord from the Spirit of the Lord is going to work through anger and it's not going to be sinful. It's going to be purifying and cleansing. And that's a good anger. Verse 7 back where we were, and, and he took a yoke of oxen and he hewed them in pieces and he sent them throughout all the coasts of Israel by the hands of the messengers. And the word sent out said, Whosoever cometh not forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done unto his oxen. And the fear of the Lord fell on the people and they came out with one consent. And the first thing a leader needs to do is rally the troops. And he, and he rallies the troops. Now, now what he does, he, he takes a yoke of oxen, he uses them in pieces, and he sends them out. Now, he doesn't say, I'm going to do this to you. I'm going to say, I'm going to do it to your oxen, because I'm not going to harm you. But I'm going to bring some, it's going to cost you something if you don't get in on the battle for the Lord. And he lets them know, look, it costs something to fight on the Lord's behalf. We got in on a free ride of salvation, but discipleship costs, service costs, and it ought to. And it's not unreasonable for us to give something back to the Lord. It's not, a, I don't think it's unreasonable. Does anybody think it's reasonable? I'm getting any hands? Because sometimes I wonder sometimes. So, so he puts out, you know, look, we need, to, we need to stand together on this. They're talking about bringing reproach on the people of God. They're talking about casting the right out on God's people. And they say, well, those are disobedient brethren. They're our brethren nonetheless. And they're in a time of need. And now it's time to stand. Because it's the name of God that's going to suffer. And the word of God that's going to suffer. Verse 8. And he numbered the people. He numbered them in Bezek. Now what he began to do is, it wouldn't have made sense militarily. Now you're going to see the Spirit of the Lord is going to guide this man. This man didn't know how to be a leader. This man wasn't trained. In, in any type of uh, military instruction. This, this guy's a farmer. But it's the same thing in terms of the battles of the Lord. God calls men from all walks of life that have no training. And when God's Spirit comes on them, He guides them. And if only we could learn to have enough confidence 
to get behind God's man when God puts him out in the battle, rather than second-guessing and saying, I think we should do the tactics this way. Why don't we let God work with that man and follow? Well, you don't have any training. You're well, look, at God's working. God's in this. This is for God's glory. And so it was a wise thing that the Lord had him do. Why number them in Gibeah? Bring them up here and number them in Bezek. Amass this army in such a position that all I got to do is make about an eight or ten mile trek across the Jordan River and make a direct attack. And they numbered them. And the children of Israel were 300,000. And the men of Judah, 30,000. I find that interesting. The ratio is 10 to 1. It's 1 out of 10. 1 out of 10. Judah, ultimately, as the centuries will go by and pass, these folks out here will fall first. These folks in the north will fall second. And these one will carry the banner of the Lord for such a long time, not only through the captivity, but returning from the captivity, that folks won't even refer to them as Hebrews or Israelites anymore. They'll refer to them as Jews. They're going to be the remnant and it's one out of ten. Where do you see that? Luke chapter 17. Yes? So are you saying that uh, it's not listing them separately? It's just saying Israel Even if you did it together, one out of eleven, one out of ten is a close ratio. I understand, brother. He's a good mathematician. He's saying it might be 330,000 with 30 is 1 out of 11. Might be. But 1 out of 10 is very close to the principle. And I want to show you in the scriptures how it worked with the Lord here. Uh, 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 Luke 17, verses 11 through uh, 17. When the Lord Jesus was passing through the midst of Samaria and came to a village, and there met him 10 men that were lepers, which stood afar off, and they all asked the Lord Jesus, lifting up their voice, have mercy on us, Master. And Jesus, with his mercy, said, go show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass, as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And that, that's pretty much how it works with God's people. Now, now, all of them were cleansed. And of course, we know in 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. And, and leprosy is a picture of sin. And the cleansing that Jesus did is like the forgiveness of sin and giving them a new heart. He gave them new skin. He gives us a new heart. But, but only one out of ten comes back and falls at the feet and gives thanks. And of course, when you spend time at the feet of Jesus Christ, you're a disciple. And Jesus says to that one, By faith hath made thee whole. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, I pray thy whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. I mean, that's a, that's a whole disciple that stays close to the Lord. That's about all he gets is maybe one out of ten that are disciples. But thank the Lord, he doesn't cleanse people based on discipleship. <laughs> Heaven's going to be very sparsely populated, and I'm going to have a lot of acreage up there, but I don't think that's going to be the case. The few disciples are going to have a lot of acreage. Um, getting back to where we are, but we see that, that number, that uh, ratio falling so often in the scriptures. And he numbers the folks, and he gets them ready in Bezek. And, and they said unto the messengers that came, Thus shall ye say to the men of Jabesh-Gilead, Tomorrow, by that time, the sun be hot, ye shall have help. And the messengers came and showed it to the men of jabesh and they were glad. So, so he sends messengers back. He says, tell the city, you, you don't have to weep anymore. I mean, yes, we've, we've assembled ourselves. We're ready to come to your defense, to your aid. Although you may not be worthy, and many of us aren't worthy when the Lord comes to our aid, when we've done foolish things outside of his will, he sends uh, help 
when we cry out for help. Praise the Lord. And, and here it is. And, and the people were glad. Verse 10, uh, Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you. He's talking to Nahash now. So they, they go back, they tell the people, we got help coming tomorrow. And then they go to Naash and say, okay, tomorrow we're going to come out to you, and you shall do with us all that seemeth good unto you. It's kind of setting them up. Naash thinks, oh, okay, they gave up. Nobody came to, to defend them. Nobody's going to come to their aid. How many times the serpent probably thinks, this guy is so far outside of God's will. If this guy prays, his prayers are going to be ineffectual. Uh, the Lord's not going to do anything for him. He's a worthless bum. And then the, the serpent finds out he gets whacked in the teeth again when the Lord stands up for his people that cry out to him. What a blessing. But he's setting them up here. <laughs> Lord, cover this. Sometimes I think the serpent is not that bright. But he must think he's actually going to win these battles. And he's gotten knocked down a lot of times in the course of history. And he keeps on trying. I'll give him one thing. He's persistent. Which, by the way, what about us? I mean, if a, lot, a guy that's going to lose, and it's written in the book he's going to lose, and I, I think he kind of knows that the book says he's going to lose, and he doesn't give up, why would we, when we know we're going to win? I mean, we don't think we're going to We know we're going to win. I mean, no matter how many times we fall down, we got to get up. We're going to win. I mean, it's, it's, it's destined. We're going to end up standing on our feet. So why not take a little effort and do it now? Anyways, he sets up Nahash. Uh, we're going to come out to you tomorrow. Verse 11, And it was so on the morrow that Saul put the people in three companies just like Gideon did back in the book of Judges chapter 7 <laughs> when he divided those 300 men into three different companies. Uh, and, and, and the Lord does a lot of things in threes. He divides his work in three parts. The father's got his part. The son's got his part. The spirit's got their part. They're all working together on this thing to see that we're going to get the victory. And they came into the midst of the host in the morning watch. And they slew the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it came to pass that they which remained were scattered so that two of them were not left together. I mean, what... what uh, under the guidance of God's Spirit, Naash was so comfortable that I'm going to win this battle, that he was out there, his troops were out there, they were just sleeping, thinking these folks are going to come out, and they're just going to be waving the white flag tomorrow, and they're sleeping, and, and Saul marched that, those troops up through the night, came, and in the morning, they just came upon those folks and just won the victory. And we'll always win the victory in the morning when the sun rises. We'll always win the victory when we, when we come early to the Lord and we let the sun rise on our problems. You got a problem? Let the sun rise on it. Let the Lord win the victory. And you'll slew the Ammonites. You'll slay them. And there's not two left together. They're going to scatter. Verse 12, And the people uh, said to Samuel, Who is he that said, uh, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men that we may put them to death. If you remember in the last chapter, when, when Saul was anointed, there was some men of Belial that said, how can this man save us? And they despised him. And I think part of the reason that Saul ended up going home and ended up going back to farming is those men spread a bad message about Saul. Oh, God will never use him. He's never been trained properly. He has no military background. His father wasn't a soldier. He's not a soldier. That guy's father wasn't a pastor. He's got no training. You can't use him. No one will use him. Why don't you just stay away from him? And I think the murmuring and the gossip of the men of Belial had so separated the nation that everybody was just living like they were living before. And they didn't even realize God was establishing a kingdom for them. And that's why they were all scattered about. And people were taking advantage of it. Now in this victory here, this is an opportunity for Saul to be vindicated. Let's bring these children of Belial forth and let's slay him. But verse uh, 13, Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day. For today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. 
and, and Saul at that moment with the Spirit of God on him and directing him, number one, directed him to a military strategy that would win, and number two, recognized it was God that won the victory, not I. I didn't win it. And, and, and therefore, I can't take any credit for it. And I think that's a good thing. And we're going to see, uh, we're not done with the chapter, but this is a good point that I see here right now in, in uh, Saul, recognizing this. And now as this victory is won, Samuel. Now, Saul had included Samuel before, back in that earlier verse. Uh, verse uh, comes not to Samuel 7. Because this king, early on, recognized, I need the help of God's prophet. And he consulted with Samuel. And now Samuel, when the victory is won, Samuel said, come, let us go to Gilgal and renew the kingdom. So they come back from Jabesh Gilead. They come through and they come south. And I know that uh, Saul himself lives in Gibeah, but Gilgal is the place where Samuel has part of his circuit that we read about uh, back there in the seventh chapter. And it's part of the wheel of uh, Samuel's uh, circuit. And they determined to renew the kingdom there. And all the people went to Gilgal. And there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. And there they sacrificed sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. And so although Saul had been anointed in the prior chapter, this is the time when finally the murmurings of the children of Belial had been put aside because Saul was able to be put to the test, let the Spirit of God and Samuel lead him and win a victory. And now for the first time, the nation is understanding, hey, we're a kingdom. That's why he uses the word renew the kingdom. Wait a second, we, we established it a chapter ago. But some time has passed and nothing happened and now we're renewing the kingdom. It's, it's a portrait here of often what happens into one of our lives. Let me look at it this way. I, I see a, a few players in here. You see Nahash, and he represents the enemies of God. We see Jabesh Gilead, and they represent, if you will, the Christians that have determined, I'm not going to live for God in this life. I'll, I'll take the salvation. I'll see you on the other side. And amen. And then the Lord says, okay, with the other nine run along and have a good time. And the Lord is good. Then you see the ones that want to serve the Lord. But a curious thing happened. Saul was anointed. But because of all the murmuring and the talking and the lack of confidence, I said, am I really anointed? Let me just go back and do the things I, the way I've always done these things. And how often it is when a, a Christian newly gets saved. Saul here will be picturing a new Christian. You know what? There's no difference between a new Christian and a carnal Christian. Go, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Particularly when adults get saved. With children, I, I can't, I don't know. But with adults, this is a truism. And I believe Paul was talking to adults at the Corinth church. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul speaking to the believers in Corinth. And, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat. For hitherto, up until now, you're not able to bear it, neither... Uh, yet are you able at this moment because you're still yet carnal. But he says carnal's like babes. When you first get saved as an adult, you're a babe in Christ. But as a babe in Christ, you're carnal. Because, I'll take my example, I had lived 39 years and then I got saved. Now we'll subtract maybe 12 years out of my 39 because I didn't learn much the first 12 years. But from 12 on, I did a lot of studying and reading and everything. So I had about 27 years of the wisdom of Egypt in me. Philosophy, science, whatever, bad religion, which I discarded. But I mean, I had 27 years of a, of a, of a mode and a manner of living that I had accumulated. It was all carnal. 
because it was according to the wisdom of this world in Egypt. Then I got born again, and inside me there was a little baby, a little baby. You, you, you couldn't tell the difference between me and, and a lost man for the first few months. You, you really couldn't. I, I, didn't, I still had my old habits. I did a lot of things that I used to do. And I would say this with, with a Christian, a new Christian. Imagine two women, both of them 26 years old. One of them is not pregnant, and the other is pregnant with uh, two weeks or three weeks. If they came in a room, could you tell the difference, which one was pregnant and which one wasn't? Of course not. I mean, he hasn't had time to show. There hasn't enough time to grow and to show anything. And that's how you are when you're first saved. You're still carnal. You're like a babe. And Saul was newly anointed, and he was like a babe. And it wasn't as bad as Jabesh Gilead. They were older babes. They were carnal. They had determined, I'm going to stay a babe the rest of my life. Peter Pan, Christianity. I'm not going to grow up into the Lord. I'm just going to live the way I want. Okay. And what God needs to do with a babe is give him an opportunity and a test. And put the spirit on him and give him a chance. There's time for the babe to have his first trial. And this is what the Lord's doing here. And that's like a renewal. I mean... That's when the Lord gives you that first test. That's like renewing your shot in the kingdom. You're now ready. Are you going to be discipled? Are you going to let my spirit guide you? Are you going to do it the way I tell you to do it? Or are you going to choose to do it your way? And, and Saul passed this test. When this came and the spirit came on him, he followed the leading of the spirit God. He followed the leading and he went to Samuel. He didn't fight this battle without the one that anointed him. It's all smart things to do. When the first test comes in your life as a babe in Christ, you don't fight it on your own. You let the Spirit guide you and you let your counselor, whoever helped you, guide you in that battle. And Saul did all these things. And the kingdom, of course on a much bigger picture, it's like a renewal of the kingdom for all the people around, for all the people witnessing that babe all of a sudden see that one stand and go, wow, there really is a change. This really is new. This, this is renewed. This isn't just some short-term thing that happened here. He told me about three months ago that he went to church and got saved, but now the first battle came and he took a stand. What kind of battles will come in your life? Could be a battle with the family in terms of, uh, we've got a big party going on. We've, and we're going to have a lot of alcohol and drinking at it. And you always used to come before. And all of a sudden, you have to take a stand with your own family. and say, You go to your pastor, you go to your counselor, say, is it right for me to do these things? I, I don't think it is. No, and you, you take a stand. And you follow the leading of the Spirit of God, and you take a stand. And the kingdom is renewed, and everybody takes a look and goes, this is, this is real in this person's life. The first time when, when the boss says, I want some overtime, you've always given overtime before, but I want it this Sunday morning. And you, you go to the pastor and say, I don't know what to do. And, you, and the pastor says, well, look, this is the time when God is to be honored. This is like our Sabbath on Sunday. And there's, there's, a, there's 150 other hours in the week that you can work in a 168-hour week. Well, this is the time to take a stand. And you take a stand and the kingdom is renewed. And all the inhabitants realize this, this is different now. And this is the picture that's going on right here for us spiritually. And this was the time when they actually coronated Saul. Not just he is anointed, now he's coronated. Now the people realize, hey, he's taken a stand. Now the people realize, hey, this is someone I can, I can follow. This is someone I can believe in. Now this is the work of the Lord. Because unfortunately, Saul's going to take a fall. <laughs> but, but he takes a stand initially. So... How would I say to this, to you, Christian? I would say this way. It's not how you start, but it's how you finish. Some Christians have taken their first stand, like Saul. But then after a while, they got comfortable with the victory, and then they sit back on their laurels like Saul's going to do in the next few chapters, instead of realizing that when you're inside the promised land, God give you a time of rest, but there's another battle looming on the horizon. And that's just the way it's going to be until the trumpet sounds. Saul starts out good, but it's not how we start, Christian. It's how we finish. Paul says he finished his course. And God wants us to finish our course.
But the picture here is that the kingdom is renewed. Every time we take the right stand, we renew our place in the kingdom. We renew the fact that we're a soldier of the cross. We're going to endure hardness for Jesus Christ. We're going to go out and we're going to let the Lord and his spirit and his people guide us in the victory. And we'll get the victory every time. Now, not only is the kingdom renewed, in the next chapter, Samuel is going to renew more, as we see next week, and we'll continue in there. Samuel is going to renew his resignation, which is going to be very important, because at this time, God wants these people now to follow that king, and God wants to put more of the mantle of responsibility on the king and stop taking it off the counselor to the king. Because what happens is eventually God wants you to start to wear a mantle and stop letting your pastor and your counselor wear it. And so next week we'll see how Samuel continues in renewing his resignation and explaining to the people that they must obey the voice of the Lord and stay with his commandments and God will be with them. The coronation of Saul and a good start. But the Lord wants us to have not just a good start, to continue steadfastly and have a good finish. Any questions on what we looked at tonight? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, for these pictorial examples that you give us in the scriptures and showing us that uh, you desire us not to be carnal, but we understand if we're babes, you're going to give us an opportunity to, to be tried and to be tested. And, and in the opportunity, you'll give us the spirit and you'll give us a counsel and you'll give us a path for victory. And we can have the victory, Lord. And then, Lord, you'll give us opportunity again. Just help us to be steadfast. Help us to, to be thankful. Help us not to fall. And if we do fall, help us to rise up again, Lord. And we thank you for your blessing. And we thank you for your provision. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.